And hello. Okay, let's uh, let's get going. And I'm going to ask Leonora to join us on the stage. So turn on your, there she is. And if you start sharing your screen and I'll do a brilliant introduction of you. Um, so last year when we first ran this event, um, I happened to read a, a great article where Leonora was talking about the impact of women um, in the workforce from a pure economic sense and how all of the data points to the fact that women are often adversely impacted in the workplace. Now through COVID and the recovery, we're still seeing women being impacted and the government's policies are not necessarily helping with that. So I asked her to come back and speak again because I just love hearing her talk. So Leonora is an economist. She lectures at RMIT and she was just recently uh, nominated or voted as one of the top women uh, voices in economics and I have forgotten what that was but it was an amazing accolade there were a couple of other Australians in there but lots of fantastic people around the world were nominated and we are so pleased and proud she's joining us again Thank you so much, Andrea, for such a beautiful welcome and, and I'm very humbled and um, very appreciative to be part of this amazing experience and to share what I can uh, among this program of really enlightening uh, and impassioned people. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this HEROES community. Uh, you're right, I come from an economics perspective here and thank you for this opportunity to share uh, what I can from an, uh, looking at the economics of what has happened during the pandemic. And my approach here is to look at the research, the statistics, the data, and to take a bit of a, an, a, bit of a stop take of what has happened, how can we make sense of what's happened, particularly through a gender lens, and how can we look to the research and the programs and the initiatives that are available to really target a recovery that is gender equitable and doesn't inadvertently advantage one gender over the other, because otherwise there is a risk that this pandemic will exacerbate uh, those gender gaps that we're trying so hard to close. Um, so hopefully you can see my um, screen there and I'm going to move to the next screen and um, I assume it's working okay. Let me know if, uh, if not. Um, but thank you for the very, um, the very uplifting and um, and gracious acknowledgement of country, Andrew, at the beginning. Um, I'm based at RMIT University and uh, RMIT is based on, uh, located on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Where I'm speaking to you from today, I'm actually located in Southeast Queensland. So I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands here in Southeast Queens Queensland, which are the Ugamba people. On this next slide, I would like to share just the way in which our Indigenous culture brings so much enlightenment um, to all Australians. This beautiful artwork on the screen you can see is by one of our RMIT students, Lou Bloomer. And it's a image of our times. You can see the quote there uh, by Lou, and it describes how these leaves of change are symbolic. They're evocative of our beautiful Australian wildlife. They represent the gum trees and the sunlight falling on the trees, on the leaves. And they're meant to be representative of that fresh start, that boldness that we're all looking, looking to um, after the shock of the pandemic and the way that we're entering 2021 with that, um, that hope and um and promise for the future. So I think that's a beautiful way for us to start. We want to take stock of what's happened, but we want to channel and focus on all the promising opportunities that lie ahead of us now. Uh, in my presentation today, I've got three broad questions for us to explore. What have been the effects of the pandemic? I'll look at some work 
workforce indicators as well as, as well as some other very important indicators of uh, economic security and well-being. I'll then turn to what are some of these risks as well as some of the opportunities for a gender equitable recovery. And I'll look particularly at the, um, the in increasing uh, uh, feasibility of working from home, which brings so many great opportunities as well as some potential risks. So I'll just point towards the ways that we need to make sure that we harness those opportunities to um, improve and enhance uh, equality and uh, and to be aware of the potential ways that um, this shift in workplace practices could inadvertently exclude some workers. So we want to just have our have our radars up, and so we anticipate and prevent those changes. And then finally, I've got some thoughts to share with you about a bigger picture approach. As Andrew has mentioned, the last few months have really been one of um, momentous reflection and change and upheaval, I guess, in, in the wider Australian culture and uh, especially with respect to politics and what's happened in, in Canberra, where we are reassessing what does, what does gender equality mean? Um, what, do, what does equality of opportunity for women and equal treatment of women mean in society and in Australia today and in wider Australian culture? And in some ways we have seen an acceleration and an intensification of awareness of these barriers and these um, sources of inequality. But at the same time, I think um, we shouldn't be blind to the fact that we still face a lot of resistance. And often what we see is at moments of time, moments of history, where there is an acceleration in terms of social progress and awareness of social injustice, it can also intensify resistance against that. So both ends of the spectrum can be activated. And that's potentially what we're facing. And that's on top of the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic looking to build an inclusive and equitable recovery. But at the same time, we're hearing potential back on that on the basis that some organisations are now feeling that financial crunch, that financial pressure where they could potentially be deprioritising the importance of equality measures and pushing it aside and thinking, well, that's a nice to have, but not an essential. So all those factors are all coming into play at the moment. And I'll share with you um, a framework for potentially navigating that. So let's have a look at uh, some of these statistics to begin with. And I guess as an economist, we want to be um, really objective and and here are the facts, but I'm also aware that some of these statistics are quite um, uh, dismal and disheartening. Um, so I apologise, <laughs> I apologise for bringing you know some bad news here, but we will um, compensate towards the end of the the uh, end of the presentation, where you know the positive and um, more optimistic picture. Uh, so to begin with, this is basically what the uh, employment patterns in the Australian workforce look like and you can see it's um, it's showing that both men and women were affected and this focus on gender is not to the exclusion of acknowledging the suffering and hardship that many men experience as well but we are looking for these overall patterns keeping in mind we do have these gender equality um, goals so what you can see is there was a there was a um, dip and a, a very sharp more than a dip, a very sharp decline. Um, and men's jobs tended to recover more quickly than women's. Um, at one point, uh, when you looked at overall net job losses, three out of five job losses were being shouldered by women across Australia. And in Victoria, it was four out of five. I'd like to make the point here that we're going to be talking in terms of this binary definition of gender, because that's how the statistics are available to us. Um, but uh, um, underpinning all of this, we um, certainly acknowledge and respect all the individuals who identify beyond those binary definitions. Um, now, what contributed to that very stark gender 
differential, many of you would be attuned to this already based on what was being discussed in the in the news and, and wider public debate. It very much emanated from the fact that we do have these gender segregated um, patterns in the Australian workforce. And you can see here, here are the largest industries of employment um, by gender. Um, so for women, uh, who, we see that one third of women's jobs come from healthcare, social assistance and education training. Um, for men, um, one third of jobs, if you added up construction, manufacturing and transport, postal and warehousing, that would take care of one third of your male workforce. So we do have these very stark um, gender patterns. The nature of the lockdowns and the industries that were forced to close down uh, to wind back business as we are all familiar with. Um, they were accommodation and food services, um, retail trade. And now a year later, if we look at the data from February 2020 to February 2021, so we've allowed for the shock of the pandemic and a few months of recovery, the net job losses have been sustained in accommodation food services administrative and support services and education and training. And um, you can see that two of those alone are in the top five largest employ uh, industries of employment for women and administrative and support services is also um, a, a very large employer of women. So um, we can see that jobs are coming back, but not in the industries that um, women pre were um, most heavily reliant on for jobs. Um, we are seeing movement, we are seeing people transition and reskill, which is excellent. And that's what um, responding to these shocks is about. Um, but there is a risk that if women are refinding jobs in other industries, are they going to the bottom of the occupational ladder again? Or are they being recognised for the skills and experience they already bring and um, and have, have more opportunity to to make this, you know, less of a setback in their career, but more of just a pivot. So they're all the things that as economists we are, we are concerned about. What was really stark overall was this drop, this decrease in what we call workforce participation. So these are the people who are in the workforce either employed or looking for a job unemployed. And what we saw is it was disproportionately more women whose labour force participation rate um, dropped. And this was partly as a result of those jobs not being there anymore, but also the pool of unpaid care, housework and homeschooling responsibilities that were um, in the main being carried out by women. We heard some, we've heard some um, really inspiring stories of men, of course, um, taking on more homeschooling responsibilities and house and unpaid care and, um, and, and doing so in a way that they probably would never have otherwise had the opportunity to do so. Um, so there is a, there are breakthroughs there. Um, but what we did see is overall, this did contribute to a um, drop in women's labour force participation. It has picked up again. This is really promising. What I would add here as a caveat is um, women are refinding jobs, but the underemployment rate is actually um, higher amongst women, meaning that they've got a job, but they're not getting as as many hours that as they would aspire for. Um, just to paint a bit of a picture about what exactly was happening in Australian households during the pandemic, this survey was conducted uh, during the um, lockdown period in May 2020. And you can see that um, if we look at housework and caring for children, supervising children, caring for the elderly, sick and disabled, um, both men and women on average increased the amount of time that they were putting towards that. Um, uh, you can see women were still doing more though. Um, and so far we've been looking at those who were really displaced from the, from the uh, workforce. On the flip side, we have occupations where employment security was really strong. They were in high, high demand, high need. They, these were the people, the glue that kept society together during the critical moments of the pandemic and continue to do so. Um, nurses, checkout operators, aged care workers, mental health support workers, just to name a few occupations there. We know that all of these industries are um, 
predominantly uh, filled by, by women. So nursing, you're talking around about 90% of nurses are, are female. Um, and the research is coming through now to indicate that not only were these uh, occupations more at risk of being exposed to the virus due to the they were essential uh, essential jobs and they had to continue that um, in-person communication and contact with members of the public but they're also at risk of burnout and I think we're yet to see that fully manifest itself there's a lot of um, support and attention being placed towards this um, this concern, uh, for example, Beyond Blue has put together uh, support initiatives uh, specifically for the healthcare workers and mental health support workers are there to to help members of society, including those in um, community services, those facing domestic violence, for instance, and yet them themselves have reported feeling inundated, exhausted, um, that emotional toll is also hitting these workers. So we have to think about how do we sustain those industries. They are disproportionately made up of, of women um, and they underpin the capacity for so many other occupations to continue to keep rolling along. Um, some of this mental health and psychological distress uh, was has been captured. Uh, the ABS has reported the, these statistics here that say that um, a relatively higher share of women are reporting feeling high or very high levels of psychological distress. Um, and this is even higher amongst people with a disability and people with caring responsibilities. What underpins this? There's some really interesting research uh, that was conducted pre-pandemic even that points towards women um, experiencing higher um, mental health distress um, during times of economic downturns and which can even manifest itself as physical pain. Um, and some of the research points towards the fact that women on average tend to show more empathy and so they are absorbing the worries, the concerns of people around them and in their household. So one example could be that in a, in a um, typical household, perhaps um, the woman may have retained her job. It could have been her, her husband or her, her male partner whose job is more precarious um, or she's worried about her children, if she's got teenage children, um, what's happening with their schooling, their education opportunities, their job opportunities. Um, the research shows that women tend to be absorbing that concern and that worry um, even more so on average than men. Um, I don't, uh, it's important to um, acknowledge some of these even more dis uh, distressing and disturbing outcomes terms of domestic violence um, increases. Um, and this is something that increasingly is overlapping into the employment space, which is why I mention it, because people are working from home. We're now seeing in a legal sense, what is an employer's responsibility for keeping their employees safe if they are working from home and potentially um, exposed to the risk of domestic violence. So that's why I mention it in this context. Uh, this is somewhat uh, uncharted territory for many workplaces. And so there are, there's work going ahead, there are initiatives going ahead um, for us to be tuned into this and, and to set up the right policies and practices and systems um, to um, address this. Underpinning all of this, I've talked very much about women on average and in aggregate, so in total. Um, Pre-pandemic, and we know this has been evident throughout the pandemic, we know that these more vulnerable groups of the population, they face additional barriers, additional risk, um, uh, less access to support, um, including our Indigenous women, women with a disability, LGBTQI, women from refugee and culturally or linguistically diverse backgrounds, women from lower income backgrounds, um, older women, and women in geographically remote regions. So I would like to um, firmly acknowledge that a lot of what we have discussed um, is compounded even more for, for these um, socioeconomic groups and socio-demographic groups. Um, I've talked a lot about um, the effect on women and in my work, I do, I, I do um, look closely at this 
process called gender lensing, where we acknowledge or we analyze the impact of a shock or an effect through a gender lens, which means we're not just focused on what's the effect on women, but what are the effects, how do the effects differ for men um, compared, compared to women, which also um, it uh, leads us to identifying areas where men could be experiencing relatively greater hardship or suffering. And some really um, fascinating and enlightening research has come out of um, the Melbourne Institute where they were looking at which cohort of the population was actually experiencing the greatest um, relative increase or the greatest surge in um, in uh, mental distress during the pandemic. And what they identified, it was working fathers who had young children. So on this diagram, you can see the aqua line is pre-pandemic and the gray line is um, during the pandemic. And so you can see the difference. This is males, uh, men who have a youngest child between zero to four or five um, to 11. So even though women tended to um, have higher levels of anxiety before, um, the pandemic, what we saw was that increase, um, that surge was greatest amongst these um, men. Now, what could explain that? Um, it's possible, well, the authors um, mentioned that um, these men tend to be, compared to their female partners or compared to women in general, less accustomed to trying to balance work and family life um, together. And if we think back, some of you hopefully can remember this. This was something that occurred before the pandemic. This was a, um, a, 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 a um, professor who was being uh, interviewed online. He was working from home. And you remember his adorable toddler bounced into the room behind him. And his reaction was he was mortified. He was horrified about um, uh, this destroying his professional reputation. You can see the picture of him actually pushing the young daughter out the way. And if you follow the video, you'll see that even more unfolds behind the scenes here. And it really caught the public's attention because I think so many people could relate to it. Um, and what it shows is that potentially it was men more so than women who were more anxious about um, uh, that overlap, bringing together their work and family lives um, and the risk that it might look like it's eroding their perception of professionalism amongst their their peers and, and their colleagues. Whereas women socially is a little bit more acceptable for women to be able to do that. So the pandemic really, you know, smashed through a lot of these, um, you know, previous anxieties. But at the same time, I think that that concern, that worry about, do I look unprofessional if my if my child pops into the scene behind me um, or if my cat walks across here? And it could be that men carry a greater weight of anxiety and burden, um, uh, potentially more so than, than women. So that's something for us to navigate, I think. And I think people have a lot of um, perceptions that, that uh, working from home has helped to uh, humanize us. Um, uh, and and help us relate to you know life beyond just the professional space. So if we look a bit more closely at working from home, some of this um, data that's coming in is showing that it's uh, currently um, about 40 44 percent of women and 41 percent of of men in Australia are working from home. This comes from the ABS's latest survey. Um, and previously, before the pandemic, rough estimates that that was just in single digits. So you can see the, the change that's occurred. It's become more feasible. It's also become more acceptable, which I think was largely a lot of the barrier that um, existed before the pandemic. What's really interesting is that transition back to the office now. Uh, what seems to be coming through in the data and the surveys um, and consistent, I think, with expectations, it's more men that are returning to the office as well as people who generally don't have children, uh, don't have the capacity to set up an office and have good internet at home, um, younger people are wanting to come back. So what we are potentially seeing is a bit of a, a, a demographic segregation and who's coming back to the office, who's staying at home. And you can see here the gender divide is quite stark when we look at um, who has a preference for doing even more work from home in the future, uh, a relatively higher share of, of women more so than men are reporting that. 
So that's a trend for us, I think, as employers, as organisations to tune into. The reasons for wanting to work from home, um, the, this, this is a list of reasons here. Um, when you look at potential gender differences here, the one that does stand out is childcare and family considerations being relatively more common amongst women than amongst men. Um, so this has certainly brought a lot of benefits. It was it was a workforce arrangement that I think a lot of people really were aiming for before um, before the pandemic, um, knowing that it would enable more women or more people with caring responsibilities to balance work and family rather than have to step out of the workforce already. Here are some potential risks though. If we're seeing disproportionately more women um, hold on to that working from home while men tend to return to the office or return to site. Is that re-entrenching traditional gender roles that we've worked really hard to try to undo? Furthermore, is it potentially limiting career opportunities for your work from home staff? Because we know from the uh, organisational psychology literature and literature on unconscious bias, that when you're in person, when you're communicating, when you have these incidental conversations at the water bubbler in the corridor, um, you are networking, you're building um, implicit connections that can work in favour of who gets that opportunity on that project, who's front of mind when they think about um, uh, promotional opportunities, uh, leadership opportunities, that bias towards presenteeism is unfortunately still very strong. So it does mean that we have to be fully aware of how work, uh, working from home uh, staff and employees could be disadvantaged in that way. Um, I've also just mentioned here that fatigue and deprioritization, it could lead to um, some companies just saying too much to try to arrange these, you know, handle these changes right now um, and compel their workers to come back. Um, and so with that in mind, I think here's where we have like a springboard to um, respond in a really positive way to harness this opportunity um, and to try to mitigate or avert these risks. Uh, this whole shift, we call it a shock to the economy and to the workforce, it really has opened up the doors for organisations at an individual level, at a broad level, to really be more innovative, more adaptive and more creative. And that's what we've seen throughout past um, shocks, that this really is an open door to, and, and, and a passport to be able to respond in ways that you previously thought were, weren't possible. And one of the things I want to point out there is being more open-minded about how workers from other industries and other occupations can potentially come into your industry and bring new ideas, that transferability and portability of skills. I think that's going to be really important for the overall adjustment for the economy because otherwise we're going to see these displaced workers kind of just locked out of the um, workforce and we need to think, okay, you worked in tourism, you worked in travel, you have great people skills, you could work really well in our type of industry. And I think that will actually be a source of bringing in um, both fresh innovative perspectives for that organisation as well as help to um, re, uh, steer these people towards um, meaningful job opportunities. Um, there's a really great opportunity here to support men, men as caregivers. Um, for those men who had a taste of it during the pandemic and realise it does bring benefits, um, I think a lot of organisations, and including economists as well, are um, uh, would, would be recommending that some sort of expansion of paid parental leave on a user or loser term is really important. And we call we want it to be non-transferable because we don't want men to receive it and just reallocate it to their female partners. It is about incentivizing and legitimizing men as carers. And it's not just about having the policy in place, you need that workforce culture and attitudes. I think that's gonna be one of the hardest ones to crack. Um, as I mentioned before, creating inclusive practices for your working from home and flexible uh, workers will be really important. So they don't, uh, they're not um, segregated, they're not um, missing out on opportunities and that will take some really conscious forward thinking plans. Um, and many of the other organisations I know who are participating in the program here um, have excellent initiatives and resources already available. 
Um, it's also an opportunity to really double down on objective performance evaluation um, measures so that you're not just basing it on subjective um, uh, assessments. Um, and underpinning all of this, I think this is a chance when we have these pressure points uh, for an organisation to showcase, to illustrate, um, to remind itself, where do your values truly lie? And I think any organisation for saying, oh, we're really tightly tight financially right now, we just can't invest. Well, that that might that might be so from one one point of view, but it's also a chance to really show, okay, when push comes to shove, this is what we believe in. Um, I don't know how I'm going for time. I know we started late, Andrew. I've just got one last section to quickly cover um, where I just want to share with you um, uh, a way to navigate um, your policies. And this, this is um, a framework that I've shared, I think, previously with this community, but we'll build on it a bit here. I think looking really big picture, sometimes there are so many gender equality policies out there that you just don't really know where to start, not just gender, but diversity initiatives. And we know that so many people are doing great stuff. And I think it's helpful to kind of see a bigger picture where it all fits in. And there's almost a bit of a chronological timeline here of what we have observed in practice. If we think back to recent, more earlier decades, a lot of the focus has been on just getting a level playing field of what's um, legally um, permissible. And I think that left some people with the perception that we do have a completely meritocratic system right now, um, especially in members of government. Um, but nevertheless, those gender gaps persist. Why? Because implicit biases, unconscious biases, stereotypes still exist. What we have seen more recently is this um, focus on, okay, let's get women into the workforce acting and doing the same thing that men have been doing. Um, is that really that's supporting women to get into the workforce, but is it actually getting rid of biases and barriers and stereotypes? Often we find that this, these types of initiatives can backfire because when women become too assertive or too bold, imitating a successful man, um, it contradicts a gender norm. And so there are penalties attached to that. Really what we want to be aiming for is just cleansing out those stereotypes or just really aiming for a, a quality of opportunity. So we've got men um, taking on caring responsibilities, domestic um, roles in, in the same way that we're encouraging more women to step into traditional male roles, that a gender lensing approach, and, and this picture here is meant to represent um, the initiative that was brought in for organisations when they, uh, sorry, with orchestras where they brought in a, a, um, a curtain on um, musicians auditions um, and they found that women's representation in the orchestra actually increased. They didn't think they were con uh, unconsciously um, biased but they were. So I think setting, focusing on the system, redesigning practices is really where, where we're at and for so many organisations right now um, this is really a pivot point for you to turn your attention towards how do we set up the system to be inclusive and equitable um, rather than inadvertently carry on these stereotypes. I've got a little bit of a screen here. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll just maybe skim over this one. But this is working from home as, as an example. We just reiterate some of the questions that I just mentioned before. Um, it work from, from Working from home has been a breakthrough, but at the same time, it could be inadvertently re-entrenching gender roles. And you really need to be monitoring, are your working from home staff um, proportionally represented in your pay rises, in your promotions, in your leadership opportunities moving forward? Are you inadvertently just making things even more gender stereotyped? Um, and so I think uh, creating a culture where men just as much as women are encouraged to take unpaid care um, is an important part of that. Um, Last thing here, the political context and the broader debate that's been happening in Australian culture um, regarding, you know, how do we advance gender equality? Uh, what are the barriers to that? And on the screen there, I've just picked up on some of the common um, quotes, arguments, um, defences that are put up when we try to uh, pursue gender equality. And some of these have been really salient in recent times. Statements like, we believe in a meritocratic system, we choose the best person for the job regardless of gender, as in you don't need to do anything different to what we're doing now because there is a belief that we have an equal 
equality of opportunity within our workforce and within our society. I've heard responses like affirmative action policies, diversity initiatives, are discrimination against men. So it's political correctness gone too far. What we're hearing a lot at the moment is we support diversity initiatives or equality initiatives, but we just don't have the funding at the moment. So there's an expression that, yes, we would endorse it, but unfortunately, where our hands are tied. And some of you might remember this one, uh, courtesy of our Prime Minister. We want women to succeed, but not at the expense of men. So there is something that people are still hanging on to that they don't want to let go of. There's something in the existing system that they think is working well or that could come undone if we change. And this really is a space of change management. And even though I'm an economist and I work on you know, analysing what's happening in the workforce, really, if we're pushing for change, we really need to understand what's happening at an individual level, at a psychological level, um, amongst policy makers and amongst decision makers because otherwise our policy recommendations fall on flat ears. So this is what motivates my particular interest in this aspect. What I'd like to share with you, if you're if you are hearing these types of things, if you are facing these types of pushbacks at the moment, here's one potential way to navigate it. What you have on the screen there is a visual illustration of what has been come to know come to be known as the stages of uh, grief. And this comes courtesy of the Kubler-Ross um, uh, model, um, which has been designed to sort of map out what the, the pattern of emotions that an individual person tends to experience or uh, could experience in response to shock of loss, in response to grief. And what it has also been adapted for is a response to the need for change, for the pressure, external pressure to change. And this is, I think, applicable to when we are trying to pursue progress on gender equality. Let's have a think about uh, where those, sorry, uh, uh, we'll think about those quotes that I saw on the pre, I gave you on the previous screen. How do they fit in here? What this is expressing is initially there'll be some shock and then there'll be denial. So um, playing down the, 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 in, uh, the existence of a problem to begin with. Anger, bargaining, negotiation, uh, depression before arriving at acceptance. So I would suggest that these statements like we believe in a meritocratic system, which is the best person for the job, as in the system is fine. That would come from a place of denial. Statements like affirmative action policies, well, that's discrimination against men. That's someone evoking a sense of injustice um, and frustration. So I would place that around here, anger. Statements like, well, we support diversity initiatives. We just don't have the funding at the moment. So there's a caveat, there's a condition. Um, you know, there's a compromise there. It's like bargaining, trying to figure out a way to get there, but just on your terms, not, you know, not, not what's necessarily fully required here. I would place this statement in there too. We want women to succeed, but just not at the expense of men. So there's a, there's a trade-off. So I think when we hear these statements, the way that I'm trying to make peace with when I hear these statements is that this person is on their journey. They're actually on their journey. For many of us, we weren't even aware of the nature of gender inequality and biases until we stumbled across it in our own experience or in our own careers. And so I think for some individuals who haven't yet had that lived experience or don't fully get it, it's potentially the case they are still on their journey and there might be at certain points along the journey and they're yet to sort of get to that state of acceptance. I don't want to say that we all have to push people along, but it's just one way of making sense of, okay, when I hear that, what does that tell me about that person's uh, position and that person's um, frame of mind? What I think we then see is that light at the end of the tunnel where you get uh, organisations that have gone through the process or individuals that now actually become champions for diversity in, for, in the form of um, acceptance and they want to tell everyone else, you know, you should come along uh, with me. And how do we get through this, This, you know, these uh, areas? Well, the, um, 
the research from psychology uh, suggests that at these stages, what it's about is acknowledging those feelings, providing emotional support and investing in communication and knowledge sharing. So this is where it's about that educational awareness space. What is bias? What is unconscious bias? The existence, the influence of bias. At this point, they may come to terms with the fact that biases exist, but they're just trying to negotiate. How do we, how do we address this while not giving up all the other things that I think are really important and I'm worried about trading off? So here the psychology research suggests that this is where it's valuable to activate confidence that change is possible and it will be worth the effort. And it's about capacity building, making that person feel empowered. Depression is often um, characterized by a, a, a um, lethargy and, and um, loss of energy and motivation to go forward. And then this final stage of acceptance, um, these five stages have recently been expanded to the sixth stage, which is about not just accepting and going along, but now becoming a champion for it, advocating and finding meaning. So finding some sort of higher purpose um, or fulfillment that you've actually brought about change, not just for the betterment of yourself, but for others. And that can be sort of the, 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 um, the emotion that um, elevates and um, gives ultimate fulfillment to, to going through that whole process. Um, so that brings me to a close. Um, I hope those um, those bits of information, those you know, facts and, and insights and observations have been useful for you. I'd like to finish with this quote that I came across by Renee Ryan that said, women walked into this pa pandemic behind men. We just need to make sure that men and women walk out of this panic side by side. So it's not just a matter of, you know, catching up. We were behind, women were behind to begin with. So in all we do going forward, you know, we have a, so much potential, so much, you know, the, the future of what happens is really within all of our hands um, with the decisions we make and the, the actions we take now. So thank you very much. And if we've got time, I'm happy to, to chat through with some questions as well. Thank you, Andrea. I'm, I'm on mute, which many would say is a great thing. Um, Leonora, that was just fantastic. The chat has been going off. People are absolutely loving what you're saying. Massive discussion around uh, meritocracy and Paula Kilby sort of talking about the South African interest and how it's worked there. Um, and also a big discussion around what flexible work and work from home means. Those of us that are extroverts hate working from the introverts. <laughs> Just a gender thing. But uh, I, I'm sure you would be able to But uh, Emma Jones uh, was interested to see if you had any data and we don't need it now but perhaps point us in the direction on equal parental leave from an economics perspective sure yes and if you wanted to share yes. that with me i'm happy to send it out in a follow-up email um or yeah, point so people, the, the workplace go? i would say the great starting point is wajia the workplace gender equality agency that collects data from private organizations we know that within public organisations, um, it's only the, the two weeks that's mandated, um, and the uptake um, the uptake is is actually so small um, in anything beyond the two weeks that the data is actually really hard to come by. Um, mm. So that's <laughs> that's part of the problem as well. But Wajia would be your starting point for to find that that data on the availability and and the uptake of um parental leave for men yeah. as well okay and then here has asked and i hope i'm saying your name correctly um would be interesting to know the impact of employment during the pandemic on gender from an intersectional perspective as well which um i imagine is even worse than yeah already transgender people even struggling to find so. absolutely i think once you add in those other layers of pre-existing and persistent barriers disadvantages um and and biases against 
socioeconomic groups, socio-demographic groups that are not in the majority, that have not been traditionally um, represented in uh, the workforce or in positions of leadership uh, or uh, senior roles, um, so many of the metrics that I've just discussed there are, are compounded. Um, and so a lot of it is about, you know, trying to fit into the default and the more that you um, are distant from that, that default worker and what the system was originally designed for, the, the, the more difficulties um, you are likely to encounter. I'm also aware that so many initiatives that are based on gender work for white women and do not work for, for, uh, for women outside of, um, or I, should, mm. I don't want to say outside of, but um, uh, from non-white um, or ethnically uh, diverse or culturally diverse backgrounds. So yeah. um, there are so many, so many ways that these initiatives need to be tailored to fully respect and understand not just the barriers, also, but also the, the thing, this, this that pe different socio demographic groups bring and can be harnessed and, and the values that those different um, or, uh, groups bring as well. It's not just a one size fits all, absolutely. And what I've touched on today is just the tip of the iceberg because yeah. so much of this needs to be, um, it, it cannot go and be put into practice unless it goes through an intersectional lens. Well, I think we'll get you to come and join us live at Talent Palooza in October and put you on our big stage so you can see how passionate our HR and talent acquisition community are about these issues. But I would like to once again say thank you very much. Uh, as I said, you're one of my favourite speakers. It was an amazing presentation. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. All right, lovely. If you just turn off your camera and microphone, feel free to stay on if you'd like to. And I'm going to join us by turning on her camera and microphone. He's finished. We're going into a roundtable discussion and you can all sit and uh, chew on the thoughts that you have learnt from these two presentations. So, Nikki, if you're there, pop on your camera and microphone. So again, we're starting off this stream too with someone who was one of our favourite speakers last year at So if you don't know Nikki, she's an expert in um, employee experience and customer experience. She's also tomorrow running um, a workshop for us as well around employee and customer experience. So, so make sure you online for her workshop tomorrow. So she works with a company called Nilo and she delivers leadership, culture and uh, EVP transformation programs and create meaningful work experiences. And I think Nikki might be having some trouble getting on. Um, the team are just working on that. Nikki, are you there? Right. Can't turn on her camera for some reason. She can't turn on her camera for some reason. That's okay. So um, coming up, she's here, but no option to turn on camera and audio. Um, is there a speaker link I can pop in? She's coming? Lovely. I was going to start singing because I all know how much you enjoy that. So still to come later on today, after our roundtable discussion, we have my dear friend, Nancy Fox, well, old friend. We used to work together 100 years ago talking about change. Um, and uh, then at 12.25, we have brilliant Jane and Sako from Excel talking about a partner to create, um, a, you know, people experience for their teams and give everyone great futures within CSL. Um, I'm just going to turn the presentation bit off at the moment while we sort this out. If some of you want to move to stream too, you can and you can and just have a quick chat. Let me just try and sort this out. Are you going back to the table?